Hello everyone. I thought we should start going through some of these modules together. So in chapter four, the physical layer, we're going to uh, go through the highlights. So let's start with uh, the objectives of the chapter. So you can see right here, we're going to look at the purpose and functions of the physical layer, the characteristics of the physical layer. Uh, we're going to look specifically at characteristics of copper cabling again. Uh, UTP, fiber optic, and then uh, wired and wireless media types. So first off, a quick review of a SoHo router. I know we've dealt with this enough that this is all a review. Uh, four basic functions. We have first off, it's a router, specifically routing between the ISP network connected here and anything that's connected to any of the switch ports or the wireless. So we know all this is going to be on its own private network, normally a 192.168.something-something, and it's going to route between the LAN and, in this case, the WAN. So first off, it is a router. Secondly, four-port Ethernet switch, so the four blue ports here for wired connections. Thirdly, we have a wireless access point internally. Uh, this particular model obviously has just an internal antenna. And then lastly, uh, a physical firewall. So this device will prevent any inbound traffic that's trying to enter the internet port that wasn't originally requested outbound. Uh, I don't think we really need to review basic connections. Uh, let's move on to uh, encapsulation. So encapsulation is describing the uh, process of a user starting with data to send on a network, and then what happens to that as it makes its way down to the actual physical layer. So encapsulation is always going to be on the sending side or starting at the source side. Decapsulation would be on the receiving side. Okay. So just real quick, the data is going to start at layer 7. Uh, formatting, compression, encryption, layer six. We got some communication between the actual software applications at layer five, the session layer. And then finally, at layer four, uh, TCP or UDP is going to segment the data up. It's going to slice it up. This is going to allow multiplexing, which is the sharing of single physical connections with multiple devices. Also, the sharing of that one connection with multiple applications. Okay. After segmentation and port addressing gets added in there, uh, we're going to layer three, the network layer, source and destination IPs will be added. So, this is where routing is going to focus. After that, we go down to the data link layer with an Ethernet frame. Now we know the MAC addressing is going to be added, which hopefully from the previous lesson, uh, you saw that the MAC addressing is only locally relevant. It's not going to apply when we're communicating over the internet or to any other device on another network. And then finally, that frame is going to be encoded into a certain bit pattern and then finally translated into the signal that will be transmitted onto the physical media. And that's the part we're going to look at in this chapter. We'll be looking at the encoding, the signaling, and then a recap of some of the physical layer characteristics. So check your understanding. Uh, I do highly recommend that you complete all of these within a chapter. It lets you know really if you're understanding it, and even more importantly, if you're understanding it in the way that Cisco would typically ask it on a test or on a certification exam. So true or false, the physical layer is only concerned with wired network connections. Definitely false because we know that wireless is also a type of network media, so that would be included as well. True or false, when a frame is encoded by the physical layer, all bits are sent over the media, here's the key words, at the same time. Not possible. In every network system, there has to be some sort of control method that tells devices when they are permitted to use the media. So we're going to go with a uh, false on that. Number three, the physical layer, the receiving device passes bits up to 
which higher level? Well, if we're passing bits up, we're on the receiving end. We're decapsulating. So physical would then pass it up to data link. So we're going to go with data link. Then it would go network. Then it would go transport. Then it would go session presentation application. So yes, you do need to learn the OSI model chart. Uh, I've said this several times, but it's going to be very important in both troubleshooting, but also just in learning about new network technologies, which will always use uh, layer names to refer to those. What PDU, don't forget, PDU, Protocol Data Unit. It is the last column to the right on your chart. So what do we call the information that's received by? Okay, so if we're receiving information, that means we must be encapsulating. So we're coming from the data link layer, which would mean that we're dealing with a frame there. So packets are at layer three, the network layer. Segments are at the transport layer, layer four. So let's just make sure we're good and we are correct. Let's move on to physical layer standards. So we have dealt with, to some extent, uh, the physical layer wiring standards that fall under the TIA EIA. Specifically, we've looked at 568 A and B when we make our cables or we were doing our punch downs on uh, patch panels or wall jacks. There are, though, several other standards you can see here that deal with other aspects of not just physical layers, some of them span all layers, but specifically at the physical layer, uh, things like the IEEE where it's going to specify, for example, what voltage levels, what frequencies, what wavelengths or pulses of light actually represent the data signal itself. So it does go more into um, you know, what I would consider to be more like engineering level specifications on that sort of thing. We do need to understand uh, the fundamental difference between what we call encoding and signaling. Okay. So understand that we're receiving a data link frame from layer two, and that's going to be handed down to the physical layer. So encoding is dealing with how does it group those bit patterns into a pattern that would actually represent the binary ones and zeros that will then be translated into a signal that goes out on the media. So the two predominant ones that you're going to see in Ethernet today, 4B, 5B, which is basically used up to gigabit speeds. No, I'm sorry, 4B, 5B is at fast Ethernet speeds, 100 base T, so 100 megabit, and 8B, 10B at uh, gigabit or higher speeds. So what that's referring to is how the bit patterns are, are going to be grouped. These are called uh, bit groups to represent the actual frame information. Now, after it's encoded, the last step would be that it has to be translated into an actual signal, which will be physically transmitted on the type of media. So for copper media like UTP, STP, or coaxial, uh, we're dealing with electrical voltage levels. Now, when we're learning about binary, we always say, well, a binary one is like, a voltage on and a binary zero is a voltage off. In transmission systems of data though, that is never used. That would be far too susceptible to uh, interference. So what you can see from just this signal here, it's more complex than that. It's gonna generally measure the transitions between signal levels and that would represent a binary one or zero. So this makes it more robust and like interference environments. Uh, in fiber systems, of course, it's going to be specific pulses of light. But again, there are standards that would talk about the wavelength of those light pulses uh, and all sorts of things, the timing of the light pulses and things of that nature. In wireless media, we generally refer to modulation as the to describe how the encoding is transposed onto a radio signal none of which of these are really used in data wireless um, am fm radio modulation 
uh, phase modulation to some extent. But what we're going to use, if you recall from 802.11, most of your newer types, like your AC or the newer AX, is going to use an orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which is a more sophisticated form of modulation here that just makes better use of the spectrum as well as uh, makes it uh, more resistant to interference. Now, three terms that I definitely want you to understand the difference between are going to be bandwidth, throughput, and good put. Bandwidth we use incorrectly all the time. Um, we'll say, hey, what kind of bandwidth do you get? Well, technically, bandwidth, I want to emphasize one key word here. Bandwidth is the capacity that a system is capable of. Okay. So, for example, if we're dealing with wireless, wireless systems are always capable of more speed than you're actually going to get in the real world because you have to factor in things like the overhead of the protocols, uh, the effects of interference, the effects that the environment have on the signal itself. So you're never going to get an actual measured speed on Wi-Fi that's equal to the rated bandwidth. It's not going to happen, at least not yet. So bandwidth I look at as the theoretical maximum of what the system could achieve. But realistically, we're looking at throughput. And throughput is an actual measure of data transfer. So if you've ever used like speedtest.net, or a few minutes ago, I was actually using the Google Wi-Fi app because our internet is in and out with everybody being home. And I wanted to see if we were back up online and what kind of speeds we were getting. So we are back up as of now. Hopefully you are as well. Uh, but the point is throughput is a measure. So you're going to be measuring that against like a specific file transfer rate. However, throughput still includes the overhead of all the protocols. So Cisco uses the term good put to basically mean raw data transfer. So this would factor out all overhead of protocols, all theoretical maximum. This is your raw data transfer rate. Okay, so make sure you know the difference between those. Of course, all of these are affected by latency, which is going to be delay. We know every device is going to add delay. We're going to have delay across certain transmission types. So let's have a look at these uh, check your understanding questions. Which media uses patterns of microwaves to represent bits? Microwaves, of course, are a type of wireless uh, frequency. Which media uses patterns of light? Fiber optic media, if you haven't picked up on that. In the context of networking, media is the method of physical connectivity. So it's copper, it's fiber, or it's wireless. Which media uses electrical pulses to represent bits? Of course, we're looking at copper there. Which of these is the name for the capacity of a medium? Capacity is theoretical. We're looking at bandwidth. Which of these is a measure of the transfer of bits? Well, the measure of bits, it's not specifying raw data bits, so we're going to go with throughput. Give that a quick check. Yay, we got another 100%. Let's move on to copper cabling. Copper cabling, we did spend some time on with the A+. Uh, we did some cable making. We went over some of the characteristics of especially uh, unshielded twisted pair. So this will be somewhat of a review with a few added in uh, pieces of information. So EMI and RFI, electromagnetic or radio frequency interference. They're both interference. They're going to affect uh, data transmissions on wired or wireless media. It's just a matter of what they're sourcing from. So EMI is going to be like your motors, your generators, fluorescent lighting. Radio frequencies are going to be, be a bit higher. You know, other sources of interference like wireless devices, microwave ovens, things of that nature. So in the diagram here, this would be our signal as it leaves a source device. 
as it's being sent out to the network. So it's very nice, very clean. You can see it's easily distinguishable. Now we've got to factor in two things that are going to happen to this nice clean signal. Number one, we're going to have interference. This is our interference that's going to attack that signal. So that's going to do a number on it, as you'll see here in uh, diagram three. One thing they're not showing in this diagram is as this signal is being sent across the media, the farther it travels, the more it's going to be attenuated. So you're going to see the amplitude of this signal or the strength diminish over time. Okay, that's why all types of media have maximum distances that are assigned. But factor in that attenuation plus your interference, and you're going to actually end up with a signal that looks a lot worse than this when it gets further down the line. And the thing is, the other devices have to be able to distinguish, you know, what's a valid signal here and what's noise. And at some point, that can get very difficult for the devices to do. So our different types of copper media, UTP we've worked with quite a bit, four pairs, eight individual wires, they're all twisted, shielded twisted pair. To be honest, it's not really used a whole lot. Uh, the difference is being we've got a dedicated ground connection, you can see right here, as well as this aluminum foil shielding. So this will be better when you have interference in an environment. Uh, what, the way it's going to work, it's going to use a special metallic RJ45 connector. You're going to obviously cut away uh, this insulator. That's going to leave the bare ground wire as well as the foil. Put your wires in the normal order, 560AB order. But what you're going to do is you're going to fold back both. Usually I twist the foil and this wire together. And then you fold it back onto the jacket. So you're just going to kind of fold it back like that. When you slide the connector on, the normal wires will go into the connector, but these ground points will touch the metal casing. So now when interference hits the cable, it's going to be grounded out to some extent through the metallic casing, through those wires, through the ground system in the device that this is connected to. The big problem with shielded twisted pair is you have to have good grounding in the facility itself. And if your chances are if you have that, it's a more modern building anyway, which probably is going to lend itself just fine to UTP. But in cases, you know, like heavy industrial environments uh, where you have a lot of heavy machinery, you might see this. You could also see fiber. Coaxial, we need to be aware of it. It's a two conductor cable. We've got the center conductor here. This is where the signal gets carried. And then we've got the ground, which is the shielding or braid that you see there. So that's the two conductors. Basically, only going to see it in a cable internet connection, you know, going to your cable modem. We no longer use this for any type of, um, you know, data networks. Back in the day, there was a network system called 10 base 2 or thin net they referred to it as, and that used uh, thin coax like you see here. So as we know, our UTP cable, we have four pairs. Uh, in pair order, it's actually blue is pair one, orange is pair two, green is three, and brown is four. Really doesn't matter that you know that. What's more important is that you know your 568A and B orders. We'll get to that in a minute. As I said, with shielded twisted pair, identical colors and pairs, the, ad, the addition of a shield and or possibly a ground wire. That's where the shielding is going to come into effect. Your coax, uh, be aware of the connectors. For your standard cable internet service, this is the screw-on threaded F-type, which would connect into the modem itself. N-types are generally used on thicker coax. So you won't see that too much with the thin stuff here. And then B and Cs are what we used to use uh, back when we used this type of uh, cabling for networks. Now, mind you, that was in the mid to late 80s, early 90s. So this stuff is long gone. When I got into this field in the late 80s, we were in the process of ripping all this out. 
and putting in unshield twisted pair. So let's have a go at our check your understanding on copper cabling. Which of the following attaches antenna to wireless devices? It can also be bundled with fiber optic cabling for two-way data transmission. So for most antenna that you connect to a wireless device, it's going to use typically a coaxial connection, either a, a F type or a, a B and C. Which of the following counters EMI and RFI by using shielding techniques and special connectors? That's going to be referring to our shielded twisted pair. Which of the following is the most common type of media? Well, we know that's going to be unshielded twisted pair. Which of the following terminates with a B and C, an N type, and an F type connector? We're looking at coax there. Let's give that a quick check and another 100% in the books. Let's move on to UTP cabling. So one thing you'll notice, and I've mentioned this before, is on the twists, you'll notice they're at different ratios. So if you look at the twist on the brown versus the blue or the green, you can see that these are twisted much tighter. These twists are specially calculated to cause what's called a cancellation effect. So what's going to happen is when interference hits the cable, the twists are going to throw the interference out of phase by 180 degrees, and it's going to cause a cancellation of that interference to some extent. Now, it can only do so much. So in a really, uh, we'll call it a very harsh environment for wireless, then UTP would not be a good choice, period. But those twists are calculated to cancel uh, noise and cancel interference. Standards and connectors, um, really, we know we're only really looking at CAT6 and newer here. Uh, nothing older than CAT6 should be used. You can see CAT6 supports up to 10 gigabits per second, 7 the same, and then 8 is going to go up from there. Typically, if you're going to need any more than that for a limited distance, you're generally going to move over to fiber. Uh, clarifying the correct names of a few items here. So our RJ45 plugs, those are what goes on the end of the cable as you see here. Okay, so those are when you make a cable that's called a plug. The socket or the jack, as some people will say, this would be your patch panel side or your wall jack side. So this is going to be the female side that you plug the plug into. As far as terminating of cables, uh, we should know by now, good, bad. Okay, so good because our jacket is up inside. The strain relief is catching it. Each wire is to the very end. Wires are nice and flat. Wires are too long. This is not up inside where it belongs. Wires are not very flat on top of that. This one will not last. If this was put into service, you know, one movement of a computer on someone's desk, this connector is going to pull loose. Straight through versus crossovers. Now we have to look at our 568B standards. So we know when making a straight through, we're going to use the same wire order on both ends of the cable. Straight throughs are our typical cable that we use to attach a computer to a wall jack or a computer to a switch. So the rule is if we're connecting two devices that are different, we'll use a straight through. There's one exception to that rule. That's when we connect a end device directly to a commercial router port, which is not very common. But there was one lab we did not too long ago where that happened. But if we're connecting two devices that are the same, switch to switch, router to router, PC to PC, we then need to use a crossover. 568A on one end, 568B on the other. What that actually does, if you look at the color codes here side by side, it's going to connect the transmit pair, the transmit pair on one side to the receive pair on the other. So you'll notice one maps to three, two maps to six. So transmit to receive, and then three and six map to. If you look at three, that maps to one, six maps to two. So that would be the transmit to receive the other way. So you're physically 
connecting the transmit and receive pairs on both ends of the cable when you do a crossover. Okay. Now we know there's things such as auto MDIX, media dependent interface crossover, which will look at what's connected to, say, a switch port and electronically swap the pairs if needed. But on most CERT exams, we don't assume that that's enabled. So we still want to know the correct cables to use in each situation. Um, that being said, you do need to know the color codes. So if we look at this little activity here, they want us to put the, the colors in the 568A pinout. A starts with green. So we're going to do white, green, green. Our white, orange, blue. White, blue, orange. And then white, brown, brown. That's going to be our A. Now for B, we know we're going to start B being the more common one in the U.S. We're going to do white, orange, orange. White, green, blue. White, blue, green. White, brown, brown. And we'll check that one and we're good to go there. So I would suggest you spend some time maybe with this exercise right here just getting those color codes down if you don't have them down already those can definitely be uh simulations or matching type questions on your a plus net plus type of exams so that's going to conclude the copper section of the chapter um, i'm going to stop right there with the walkthrough and we will pick up with fiber optic here tomorrow see you then